Mark chapter 8, and I would uh, invite you to stand with me as we read the word together. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he answered, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these should also be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the dis district of Dalmanutha. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us, that you work in us and through us. Lord, we thank you that you answer prayers. And Father, you have answered this prayer for a worship leader here at Calvary Crossroads. And we thank you for uh, Neil Harvey. We thank you for his wife, Kim, and their kids that they've accepted this call to come. And Neil, to be here to help in the ministry. Lord, we pray that you would open up, continue opening up the doors for him there in Austin, Texas, uh, to sell the house, to uh, sew up all the details uh, that need to be done. And Lord, that you would bring uh, Neil and his family here safely and in your timing. And Lord, we thank you that you are working. And of course, this is in your hands to accomplish all this. Father, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray that you would continue to put your hand of protection on them as forces from Hezbollah uh, are, are uh, creating uh, chaos there. We pray for peace. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as you've instructed us to do. We pray for wisdom for their leaders. We pray, Lord, that they would uh, be preserved, and these people would turn to you with their whole hearts. We know, Lord, that that's your hope, design, desire. Lord, and as we open up your word, we would pray that you would open up our eyes. You would open up our ears to hear the things that you want us to hear. Lord, that our hearts would bend uh, to your will. Lord, we would be motivated to follow you with our whole hearts as disciples, as followers of you. So, Lord, here we are. Open up our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There was a missionary to India. Mary Reed, and this is the picture of Mary Reed, and as you see her, she was a diminutive lady, small in stature, but a lady who had an incredible ministry. At age 30, she was called by God to leave Ohio after having been trained as a nurse to go to India to minister there, and she ministered uh, in the Women's Foreign Mi Missionary Society, dealing with underprivileged ladies, ladies in distress there in India. 
And after just a couple of years, the Lord reshaped her vision of ministry. And she started to minister in an evangelistic outreach that was to the lepers in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. The lepers were an isolated group. They were secluded from the rest of society because of their disease, the disfigurement. They were destitute. They were looked down upon by the rest of the society. And yet Mary Reed was called to minister to this group. And so she went to this asylum in Chandag, in the Himalayan foothills, and ministered to their needs. She did things like... Uh, did nursing work, but she also taught them to read and taught the Bible to them. And after years, there were great improvements in the asylum, in, in the ministry to these people. Uh, their living situation improved greatly. Uh, they were The huts that they lived in were replaced with cottages, she saw the overs uh, oversight of the construction of a new water system there in the, uh, the compound. Uh, a new chapel was built, a new school was built, a hospital was built, all under her service there. 67 of the 85 lepers in that colony by 1897 became Christians primarily through her ministry of service, of giving, of loving, of caring, of seeing the need that they had physically and spiritually, and she responded. You know, she rarely left that colony. She was there most of the time. She went back to the United States for one brief visit. But after some time, she also contracted leprosy. And through the years, she endured the pain, the challenge of leprosy, the indignity of leprosy in that culture. But she kept working for the Lord. And she worked in that asylum 47 years. 47 years. She died at the age of 89 in 1943, having served these people, but primarily her Lord. So what would cause Mary Reed to leave her home? The, the, the relative security and comforts of Ohio to go to India. What would cause her to leave? I would say this to leave the comforts and to, and to focus her attention, her care to the disregarded, the neglected, the excluded people. This is it. She was compelled by the compassion of Christ. Compelled by the compassion of Christ. And of course, this, this sermon is entitled The Compassion of the Christ. Kind of taken off the movie. Yes, I understand that. But it is really a driving force. And as we look at this, we're going to see that this fits us. It is something that we should be compelled by the compassion of Christ in everything we do, in every situation in which we find ourselves. Too often, we're not. Now, when I say the compassion of Christ, compassion, what does that mean? That's not, it's not a feel-good thing. It's not a, uh, my, my heart bleeds for you. I've got a definition. You see it on the screen there. Compassion is being moved inwardly in tender concern when the distress of others is seen. It is then tied to demonstrative action seeking to relieve that distress out of love for God and love for neighbor. It's twofold. It is being moved inside 
but that's not fully compassion. We can all be moved inside when we see the pictures on the TV screen of, of uh, people that are in Africa and the little kids, and we're moved. But what does compassion fully require? Action. Action. And that's what we see in this account here is the compassion of Jesus, the compassion of the Christ for people. And it is a model for us. Now, our credo here at Calvary Crossroads, if you look at the, the front side of your bulletin, it says, making disciples who love God and people. That's right out of the, the scriptures, kind of taken with the great commandment the, or the great uh, commission uh, that we're to go into all the world and make disciples, those who observe his commandments. And then we're to love as the, the first and foremost commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love people. That's our credo. That's where we're going as a church to implement this fully, to be a disciple. That doesn't mean just a few people. That means all of us. And as we look at this passage, what is a, a disciple? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hone in on this stuff. What are we supposed to be like? If you were given a piece of paper and said, write down everything that you think a disciple should be like, look like, act like, smell like, laugh like, what would you write? That's pretty interesting to think of because most of us kind of have a nebulous thought of this. Well, we're going to see some good things here. And our, our main point today is as Jesus' disciples, we are called to demonstrate compassion to those around us. Demonstrating compassion. Well, that would be on our list of things to put as a disciple. We demonstrate compassion. So here we see this example here. We're going to look at the compassion of the Christ. First off, we're going to see that the compassion of the Christ is borderless. It is borderless. That means it has no borders, no boundaries. And where do you get this, Jim? I didn't see that in the scripture here. Well, if you go back and you look through previous weeks when we've been studying this, and can it, we've taken a two-week break, obviously, so before that, just flip back in your Bible to chapter 7, verse 24. Okay, flip back in your Bible. I didn't hear the pages. <laughs> okay, swipe back a couple of pages. <laughs> swipe back, and you see there, uh, Jesus has a ministry in the first part, actually all through the book of Mark, up until chapter 7, verse 23, he is ministering exclusively to the Jewish people. It's the ministry to Israel. And, um, and that is where his focus has been and would be. Uh, if you look, chapter 6, verse 34. Oh, what a sweet sound. Thank you. Even if you don't, you don't even know how to read, just do that with your pages. Yeah. There you go. Now, this sounds strangely familiar. The count here is the feeding of the 4,000 people. We're going to go back in chapter 6, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. These are very similar but different, distinctly different accounts. Don't mix them up. And this wasn't like... Mark had a brain fade and said, oh, I forgot, I already wrote that in there. Well, I already wrote it, so just leave it. Um, we'll change the numbers. Um, that wasn't what happened here. It's, it's a completely different event. We'll kind of get into that. But look at verse, uh, what did I say? Verse uh, 34. And Jesus, when he went ashore, 
from the Sea of Galilee onto the shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach many things. So he went ashore, he saw the crowds, and he had what? He had compassion. Now, this is the feeding of the 4,000 that's going to happen in this account in chapter 6, but it's the feeding of the 4,000. That word compassion, he had great compassion, or he had compassion. Splachnitsomai uh, is the word. It's kind of a long, kind of interesting Greek word, but it is splachnitsomai, and he had that compassion on them. That, that word itself means out of the bowels, out of the bowels. He felt it deep inside, okay? And he, had, he saw them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were wandering around. They were trying to figure out what life is all about and, and where Jesus was. And he, of course, was the great shepherd, and he taught them. Uh, later in, in, in um, Matthew 15, Jesus makes this statement to the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7, same, same lady, and he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His focus, his attention was on the Jewish people while he was here on earth. But when we say that the compassion of the Christ was borderless, Jesus goes out of the region of Israel and as you can see on this map, he went from the Sea of Galilee, the north e northwest side of Galilee, up to the city of Tyre. That's about 50 miles, 20 miles up to uh, Sidon. And then came back down around out of the region of Israel down to the Decapolis. And that's what we see in chapter Seven. We see from verses 24 on, the Syrophoenician woman that he met there, she was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. She was a Gentile. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, and I, I shared this last time, God's purpose for Israel was out of Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, they were to be a light to the nations. A light. They were given the truth of God through Moses, the law, and all of the prophets, and they were supposed to proclaim God's goodness to all of the nations, but instead, they turned that into themselves, and they held on to it, that we are the special people of God, and anybody that wants to come to God has to come through us, and, and if you don't, you are a Gentile. Now, what did that mean? They called the Gentiles dogs. They called the Gentiles defiled. In fact, they, they were out of the mercy of God. That's the way they considered them. When they went out of the, the nation of Israel and had to come back in to the nation, they would take their shoes off and shake off the dust because they didn't want to bring any defiled dust back into the Holy Land. That's how intense this was. And in fact, if you want to go farther with that, they considered the Gentiles that they were created only to be the fuel that fires and stokes the fire of hell. That's pretty serious. I mean, that's not out of, uh, you know, how to win friends and influence people. That's... That's pretty hardcore. And that was entrenched in their, their cultural way of thinking. And not only from the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, but it went right down to the very uh, youngest child they would entrench this way of thinking. And so Jesus is taking his disciples out of Israel and saying, Let's go on a hike, guys. 
I'm going to show you some stuff. This is the heart of God I'm going to show you. And he takes them to Tyre. He takes them to Sidon. Takes them to the Decapolis down in the southeast part of, um, of, the, of uh, the Galilee region where it's a 10-town region, a vast area, lots of empty space, but it's peopled by primarily uh, Gentile people. And so he is going to seriously tweak the minds of these disciples. And he does it purposefully. So then we're seeing that his ministry is borderless. First it was in Israel, then it goes out uh, into Gentile regions. And that's where you have the, the meeting with the Syrophoenician lady up in, in Tyre. Then, if you were to go in chapter 7, verse 31 and following, you see this account of Jesus healing a deaf man, and that's in the Decapolis region. Now, if you want to get some correlation here, you go to Matthew chapter 15, and you see that, uh, it's Matthew 15, verse 30, is that same time when he's in the Decapolis. And it makes this kind of observation of the ministry that Jesus had there. The great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the cripple, the mute, and many others, and they put, him at, put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered, and they saw the mute speaking, the crippled, healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Notice they, they glorified the God of Israel. It wasn't their God. These are the Gentiles. They glorified the God of Israel. But look at the ministry that's going on. It is a healing ministry. It is a restorative ministry. The deaf the mute, the blind, they're being healed. It also says the crippled. And that word really means maimed. So what is the maimed? That's like someone who suffered an accident and had their arm chopped off or something, some kind of, some kind of accident where there's some really interesting restorative healing that's going on. How interesting that is. There's no mention of teaching there, but certainly of healing. And these people see this as a sign that this man who's doing this is incredibly different from anyone or anything that we've ever heard. And then we come to chapter 8. And this is subsequent to all the healing. The healing evidently has gone on for three days. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through this whole section like I typically would, would word through word, word from, I can't even say it, that's why I'm not going to do it. <laughs> word for word, uh, line by line, but you look at this in a whole. What is happening? Verse eight, uh, 1, they had nothing to eat. The great crowd was there. They had nothing to eat. We see that Jesus says uh, that they were with him for three days. So evidently this healing went on for day after day after day. They're in a desolate place. You see at the end of verse 4, a desolate place. They're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no 7-Elevens. There's no Safeway. There's no Chick-fil-A nearby. They can't get any resources, any food for this crowd. We see down there in verse 9 that it's 4,000 people. Now, in the parallel account in Matthew, it says 4,000 men plus women and children. Now, when they talk about 4,000 men, they're talking essentially head of household, but you got to figure, well, for every man, there might be a woman and there might be a couple of kids. 12,000 people, 14,000 people, maybe more. That's a massive crowd. When we talked about the feeding of the 5,000, it could have been up to 20,000, 25,000 people. 
massive, massive crowd there. And can you imagine, no amplification, no TV monitors. These people were crowding in on Jesus and bringing their sick, laying them at his feet, and he would heal them. Then the murmur goes through the crowd, the shouting. The person gets up and walks away. I've been healed, I've been healed. And they keep walking and they keep walking through the crowd. And it just spreads like wildfire. And then the, the press of the crowd trying to get close to Jesus to get that healing touch. And then going from Jesus and telling what happened. Whew, what an incredible incredible sight that must have been to be there in that crowd and experience that. But Jesus called the disciples to himself, verse 1. Called them. The crowd's there. He calls them. Hey, guys, come here. Huddle in. Get in here. He says, I have compassion on the crowd. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. Interesting. He uses that same word, splagnichomai. And that word itself, that word itself is, is beautiful. You start thinking about words in English. I have compassion. It's out of the bowels. Man, that doesn't sound real good to us. We would say from my heart, man. My heart is broken for these people. I am completely undone. I feel for them. Look, look, look at them. They're, they've been with me now three days. I've been healing them, but they're still here. Now, notice he's, he's not doing what he did with the Jewish people, teaching them. What does he want to do here? Hmm. He wants to feed them. He wants to feed them. Now, just so that you understand the difference between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000 took place in the northwest part of the Sea of Galilee, Way up high. Remember, the Sea of Galilee is like 13 miles north to south and 8 miles wide, kind of heart-shaped. And you saw the, the picture of it earlier. And, and it says in the book of John that that took place, the feeding of the 5,000 took place near the time of the Passover. That's late March, early April. Springtime. And it says that they sat down in the grass. Jesus has been with the disciples Going through this Gentile region up to, to uh, Tyre, Sidon, and then down to the Decapolis probably took, oh, maybe three months to get there. So what's the grass like? Just like here, you get into June, it dies off. It's, it's just, and it says the people sat on the ground. Have the people sit on the ground. And that just, there's no grass there. I mean, or it's dried out grass. And so it's a, it's a completely different time. Uh, it, the feeding of the 5,000, how many, how many baskets were left over? Uh-huh. And in the feeding of the 4,000, it says, okay, so there's a big difference. And here's a real clue. Very, very interesting. Um, when it says in Ma uh, Mark chapter 6, the 12 baskets, the word is Coffinos. Coffin? Okay, don't think like what we all encounter. Um, Coffinos, a small basket. It, was, it could have been a wicker basket, but it, some scholars say that it was a little like woven or leather basket about this big, enough to put a lunch in or some supplies as you're walking around. Little Coffinos. And how many w bags were there? Coffinos? Twelve. That's not a lot of food left over, is it? Jesus was exact. He was precise in how he did miracles. But the word here used in, in Mark chapter 8, 
spurus, completely different word, spurus. And there were seven spurus. Some translations say large baskets. Large baskets. Like, think laundry hamper. Large baskets. So the ministry to the Gentiles, the leftover was abundant. Very interesting. So they are very different occurrences that are happening here. Um, but I think also, just keep in mind, Spurs, whereas the Jewish mindset was to, oh, the Gentiles, they're to fuel the fires of hell. No, Jesus is saying, here's my compassion. There is so much, so much abundance available. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. So, Jesus' compassion is borderless. He doesn't know boundaries. Our problem, we put up boundaries, don't we? When we think of people that aren't quite like us, people that have other ways of doing things, people that don't look like us, people that don't have the same customs of us, people that don't smell like us. What is it we want to do? Isolate. We want to look down on. And Jesus is saying, no. My love is the Father's love. And the Father's love is a heart of compassion that gives to even us. Even us. And so Jesus is training his disciples. Look, if you want to be like me, you got to go beyond your boundaries, out of your comfort zone, and be prepared to minister to people who aren't like you. And when we think of minister, oh, it's real easy for us to think, oh, I'm going to do something really neat and tidy. That doesn't necessarily mean that. Minister itself means to serve. To serve. Who serves? A servant. <laughs> Let me just get down to it. He's calling us to serve. What is the key verse in Mark? Mark 10.45. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, to be served, I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. That's his heart. And he's teaching his disciples that very thing, to be just like that. That's what drove Mary Reed to go to India, to spend 50 years of her life there, because she was compelled by the compassion of the Christ. Now, the compassion of the Christ is not only borderless, it's also heart-revealing. And by heart-revealing, I mean it reveals the heart of God, of Jesus. Jesus is that expression of the Father. And so if you want to know the Father's heart, look at Jesus. Look at him, and we start seeing God. We start seeing who uh, how God loves us. And in this passage, what do we see? We see that Jesus' compassion is demonstrated in temporary relief. He's feeding them. Well, how long does that last? Till the next meal. But he said... In verse 2, I have compassion because they've been with me three days now and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they're going to faint on the way. They're going to faint. Now, wouldn't it have been easier if Jesus just used his power and said, I'll just keep them from fainting? You know, he could easily do that, and it would have been real clean, and, and they could have all gone home, no big deal. 
But again, Jesus is teaching a lesson to his disciples, as well as to everyone else who experiences the feeding. Do you realize this is, this is like the third um, most impactful miracle that Jesus did? The first one, of course, was his resurrection. His death, his resurrection is the most impactful. But then the second one was the feeding of the 5,000. 25,000 people at one time received from Jesus this great creative miracle. And now we have 4,000 people, 12,000, 15,000 people that experience this miracle. So they see this. And Jesus had the same compassion for the Gentiles that he had for the Jews. You can see it spreading out. Same compassion. I have compassion on the crowd. My heart goes out. My gut is wrenching. My heart is breaking for you. I'm in knots. I feel your pain. That's what he's saying about this. And so he sets up an opportunity for growth for the disciples to see that, that their temporal needs are important. And he gets to, he, in, I think it's the book of Matthew, it's somewhere, uh, talking about the feeding of the, the 5,000. Jesus, the commentator is saying, the writer is saying, he said this to test them. He was asking about what should we do? And he was doing this to test Jesus, or to test the disciples. As a teacher, we would give tests all the time to the students to assess how far they've come and what they know, what they don't know, what we need to work on. And here is another test for the disciples, just like Jesus tests you and me all the time. All the time. And he gives us opportunities to stretch in faith, to see where we need to grow. Here with the disciples, they had seen Jesus not more than probably three, four months before. Feed the 5,000. They're in the Galilee region. And now in the Decapolis, the 4,000. And so Jesus says, I don't want them to go. Uh, they're going to faint on the way. And his disciples answered him. <laughs> We get to see the growth. How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? It isn't the same response he got uh, months earlier with the feeding of the 5,000 where they were just going, there's no way. I mean, uh, you know, hey, we hit this kid up for some, some bread and fish, uh, but what is that among so many? Uh, they had a real limited mindset of what could happen there. But here they say, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And, and they're not as hardcore unbelieving. My feeling on this question is they're actually probing Jesus. They're probing him to see what Jesus wants them to do. What do you want us to do to these Gentiles? Sure, you're not gonna you're not gonna do the same blessing to these these heathen as you did for our the godly people of Israel. Well, quote unquote godly. God's people. And I really believe that it's just really one of those things that you could see the growth, but surely he's not gonna do that with the Gentiles. And indeed he does. And you see them, you see Jesus here ask the question, well, how many loaves do we have? And they didn't have to, you know, hit up the kid. They just said, okay, seven. I don't know if it was their lunches. You know, after three days, most everything's gone, right? And they say seven, and he directed, Jesus directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And then he takes the seven loaves 
he gives thanks to the Father and starts breaking them. And as we think about that miracle, that is a truly creative miracle. Because you have seven, I mean, just think about it. You got seven loaves, and you, and they're not big loaves, they're just little rolls. They break them, pass them out, break them, pass them out, break them, pass them out, break them. Okay, the seven is gone? No, it just keeps happening. And the the bread that's there gets multiplied from seed that was never sown in the ground, seed that never grew up, that was never harvested, that was never ground into flour, baked. It, it just was creative. And it just kept coming. And it just, got, same with the fish. He gave a blessing and started distributing the fish, breaking it. And that fish, after you get through the few of them, there are probably three or more, you know, after you start breaking them, there's fish there that never swam. S fish, fish, that n fish that never got netted up, dried, stuffed in a bag, brought along. It was created. And it says they were satisfied. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm not hungry anymore. That means they were glutted. They were saturated. They couldn't eat anything else. And it was probably the best food that they've ever had. Amazing. Amazing. And this was just to fulfill a temporal need. By the next day, they were hungry again. They were hungry. What's for breakfast? Can we have some ham and eggs? The Gentiles could ask for that. <laughs> I, amazing that, that the love of God, the care of God, the compassion of God would lead to something just temporary. What does that do to our thinking about how we should show compassion on people? For very temporary things, things that are going to come and go. Little gifts for people. Smiles for somebody who's, who's there in the grocery line, whose who's groceries just spilled on the ground. Picking it up. That's compassion. You see the need. You jump in there and do it. You serve. That's what a disciple will do. Showing the love of Christ. Oh, you don't have to preach. But do it through your action. That's what Jesus is showing us right there. Do it through your action. Just the little acts of kindness toward one another. Ministers a lot, but... The second major point here is that Jesus' compassion is, dis is demonstrated in eternal relief. Yes, he met the temporary need, but the eternal relief was much greater. And compassion can be seen. Romans 5.8 that you see on the screen, memorize it. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his love. The love is really a nice idea, concept. But if you don't act on it, it's just a concept. But God demonstrated his love by sending Christ for us. And there's a huge border there between heaven and earth. And you see Jesus cross through the border into our existence, our plane of, of living and understanding, even taking on a human body. And we think, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? I'm human. I, I, can, I, I like it. Yeah, okay, old people. Is it getting any better and any easier? No, not at all. 
Okay, but he was willing to come into these frail bodies for us. Man, if you look at, at Ephesians chapter 2, we won't take the time to do that, but you look at Ephesians chapter 2, and you see the beauty of the same thing that God demonstrates his love. It's, it, it starts off with um, the phrase, you, and I'll just say we, we're dead in our trespasses and sins, spiritually depleted, dead, inanimate, because of our sin. That barrier that we had of sin, that, 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 that unpassable chasm from us to God because of sin. You know, we sit here and say, I don't, I don't think sin is so bad. I, I do it all the time. I'm actually pretty good at it. But... That sin in God's sight is horrendous. It is so against his character and offensive to him. He created each one of us. The intention was to be holy. Adam and Eve, holy, without sin, and to live eternally that way. But when a bad choice was made, sin came into the existence of mankind and broke the fellowship, and it killed all of humanity spiritually from that point on. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then a few verses later, some of the most precious words in Scripture. Two words. But God. But God. We were, we were dead. No hope. No hope of eternal life, of, 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 of relating to God who created us, loves us. And the only remedy was God's love. But God, he did something. He was the initiator. He was the one that crossed the borders for you and for me, for everyone on this planet. Everyone who has lived, is living, and will live. He crossed that border. But God... And here's the quality, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, what did he do? Made us alive together with Christ. That is a game changer. And may that seep into our consciousness, into our souls, into our spirits, to every fiber of our being. In our hopelessness, God the initiator remedied the situation by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the debt of our sin, to pay that price so that we would be made alive, so that we would have that relationship with him. Then we're brought to John 3.16, and we're so familiar with it, and so familiar with it that it starts losing its potency, its efficacy in our life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In just a couple of lines, we see that beautiful thing that God has provided for us eternal life through his son. And all we have to do is believe. Oh, we can't do anything to earn it. Anything. And that, my friends, that is the gospel. That is 
good news that he's provided that. Jesus' compassion is demonstrated by this eternal relief. Yes, he cares about the temporary, but the eternal. Oh, far greater price on his part. It is absolutely devastating if we don't receive his gift. Finally, we see the compassion of the Christ is intended for all. It's intended for all. He passes through the borders. It reveals God's heart, but it's intended for everyone. And he models this compassion for his disciples. We've seen that, that he goes to those who are the outcasts, the lepers, the sick, the maimed. He goes to them and heals them and preaches the gospel of the kingdom to them. And then he includes his disciples in showing compassion. He does it himself, but he has his 12 that he is training. Why? Because Jesus is going, physically, is going to be off the scene in about a year. So he's prepping his guys to take over the work that he started and keep it going. And these are the apostles. This is the cream of the crop that he comes up with. The A-team. And they don't get it very well. So he has to train them. He trained them in, in Israel with the feeding of the 5,000. Now he's training them again. Go back and relearn the lessons in the feeding of the 4,000. But it is an expanded lesson. God loves his people, the Jews. God loves the world, the Gentiles, and provides great abundance for them. And he trains them. And it... it, it <coughs> Look, look at verse 6. He trained his disciples to be uh, the repeated conduits of his blessing. Verse 6, uh, the second half. He broke them, broke the bread, and he gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. Jesus breaks the bread. Then he gives them to his disciples the disciples take it from Jesus' hand and they distribute it to the crowd. You see the process. It goes from Jesus to his disciples to the world. And that's the exact same thing that he's called you and me to. We receive from the Lord. We commune with the Lord. We get close to the Lord. We figure out who he is. And he gives us the message of eternal life, the gift of compassion, of service, of care, and we take it and give it away. Far too often we do the antithesis of that. We become callous. I got the gift from the Lord, and I don't want them to have it. Uh, we, 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 we become heartless. We see the need there, but we don't let it penetrate us. We've got neighbors that are over there, and by golly, they get, they get loud, you know, on a Friday night. They're loud, and they're, they're hooting and hollering and having a party over there, and I don't like it. So... I'm just going to keep this gift of eternal life of salvation right here. <sighs> wow. We're insensitive, unfeeling, uncaring, hard-hearted, merciless. And that does not exemplify the heart of Jesus, does it? He crossed the borders. He shows the love of God to the point of becoming a servant, a slave, uh, someone who, who humbled himself to the point of death, giving his life.
He modeled it to his disciples, and then he trains his disciples to show compassion. How are we doing at that? It's a convicting message, and it's been nailing me all week, so I get to inflict this on you. <laughs> um, it's really easy to hold the gift of God. Oh, I'm busy. Oh, they'll deal with it. You know, they'll get over it. Jesus will send somebody else to them. Yeah, he might, but he wants to use you as a conduit. He wants to use me as a conduit. So how can we be a conduit? Mm. Here's just one suggestion. Start running this question through your mind. When you enter a room, when you come in contact with somebody else who's not a believer, how can I help? Just come up, not necessarily saying that to them directly, but let that go through. Lord, how do you want me to help? How do you want me to be part of this? How do you want me to influence the situation? And some of us, it comes really easy because we're, we're more expressive. Some of us are a little more reserved, you know, and quiet. Ask the question, Lord, how can I help? The problem is most of us come into a room and we come in like here. Here I am. Minister to me. Serve me. I want you to talk to me. When really we should be coming in saying, oh, there you are. There you are. How can I, how can I help you? How can I get to know you? What's going on with your life? How can I pray for you? Yeah, we get a little too me-centered, don't we? And it's, it is a common thing. So how can we be the hands of Jesus? coming into a room, into a situation? How can we show compassion, love? And it may be a temporal thing we're doing, or it may be the big eternal relief that Jesus provides that we get to share. I would say this, too. Many of us have that desire to share the, the word of the Lord with people, the, the gospel with people. Pick Three people. Just pick three people and pray for them. That God would give you an opportunity to share the word of the Lord with them. Whether it's temporal, whether it's the eternal relief. And I'll say this. Those three people can't be your family members. What? You're going to pray for them anyway, right? Right? Of course you're going to pray for your family members. No, somebody at work, somebody, somebody at the store that you, it just keeps, they keep coming back to your mind. Somebody else, your neighbor, that keeps irritating you. Pray for them. Pray for the opportunity to share the gospel. I love the way Jesus handles things. It ain't rocking science. It's just the, the thing of, are you willing to be his follower, his disciple? That's what God has called each one of us to be. That's the purpose of Calvary Crossroads, to make disciples who love God and others. And more and more, you're going to be hearing this message of discipleship. How can we really be effective for the Lord? It's by being a disciple, learning from the discipler. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your word to us. In this passage of the feeding of the 4,000, we learned so much. We're so challenged. Lord, the mirror of your word is up in front of us, and, and we look and we see how lacking we are. Lord, how compassionless we are, hard-hearted, we're callous, we're merciless. Oh, Lord, change our hearts. Change our hearts, break our hearts for what breaks yours, and change our hearts that it may be 
like yours, full of compassion for the world around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.